Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Uh, welcome everyone, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Type your name in the sidebar, tell us where you're from. Uh, our special guest today is Elaine Malone from AIB International. And the topic today is adulteration, misbranding and food fraud. Good morning, Elaine. How are you? Good morning. Doing well. Thank you. Yeah, very good. And it's bright and early where you are in, that is where you are? Manhattan, Kansas. Manhattan, Kansas. And I'm in, in, Man US. in the U.S., obviously. <laughs> That's where Dorothy, is that Dor right. the Wizard of Oz? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. of course. And uh, I'm in Manchester in the U.K., um, and we can see in the side by where we've got there, Edison from Ecuador, or it's going too fast, Francesca from Italy. Oh, Kansas, Laurie Glasgow from Kansas, USA. Great. Um, right. Keep typing your, uh, tell us where you're from there. We're going to play the ads, and uh, we're back after the ads in a couple of minutes for the presentation. Okay. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. Okay, thanks to the Food Safety Friday sponsors and AIB International at the end there. Uh, very <laughs> fitting. Star in the movie. <laughs> did you did you spot any country in the world that isn't represented in the sidebar, Elaine? <laughs> oh, goodness, no. I haven't Definitely. looked that close, but, yeah, there's quite a few, and a lot of exactly. the states in the U.S. Exactly. Uh, right, so it is being recorded today. Um We'll send you an email afterwards with the slides, the recording, and a certificate of attendance. Uh, I'll be back for the Q&A later. Try and hold your questions till the end, or else they might disappear. So <laughs> I'll hand you over to Elaine. Now I'll be back later. Thank you. Okay. Well, again, thank you for having me today. Um, welcome the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about some labeling and uh, how it ties in with adulteration and misbranding and food fraud. 
Um, each of those continue to be significant problems for the U.S. food industry. Uh, while much of the adulteration misbranding is unintentional, some of it, of course, is done intentionally to deceive consumers. Uh, this is considered to be food fraud. These issues are not only economically deceptive, some can prompt food safety concerns. The increased use of the internet to market foods and the rise in international trade creates some challenges in ensuring that the labeling on the foods is compliant for the U.S. market. A couple of months ago, Earl Arnold from AIB presented information on food fraud from a food safety perspective. I think you can probably still hear that recording if you missed it. It was done back in uh, August. Uh, today we'll look at how food labeling impacts uh, food fraud and the adulteration, how it ties into the adulteration and misbranding. Uh, we'll discuss how the U.S. defines adulteration and misbranding and how that ties in directly with the food fraud. We'll look at some specific incidences of food fraud to see what was involved. And then following that, we'll look at the general requirements for labeling foods in the U.S. so we have a better understanding of where some things can go wrong. Uh, a particular concern are those foods that are sold online and through mail order. Lastly, I'll provide a general summary of some of the strategies for preventing food fraud. Food safety isn't my um, specialty area, so that's why I'm talking more having to do with the labeling and how that ties in. Uh, but we have many experts at AIB that can assist in the areas of food labeling and then audit strategies um, and mitigation and vulnerability assessments for food fraud. Uh, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is the main set of laws that authorizes the FDA to regulate food labeling. Many of the laws that have subsequently been issued in the U.S. are amendments to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Uh, the Act authorizes the U.S. government to prevent misbranding and adulteration of food products. And now, according to the Food, Drug, Cosmetic Act, a food product is adulterated if the product contains any ingredients that are not safe or that are not allowed. This includes any poisonous or harmful substances that are added to the product that may affect the consumer's health. Even ingredients that are approved for addition to foods can be considered adulteration if they're used improperly. For instance, there's limits on the foods that folic acid can be added to because too much folic acid can lead to a masking of a vitamin B12 deficiency. So adding folic acid to a food where it's not permitted would actually cause the food to be adulterated. A product will also be considered to be adulterated if there's an absence a uh, substitution or an addition of an ingredient that would be considered to be fraud. Examples of this include omitting a valuable ingredient from a product, concealing or damage, uh, concealing damage or inferiority, or adding a substance to increase the weight and the apparent value of the product. A very simple example of this is just water. Uh, since water is not costly, adding more to a food to increase the weight would be profitable, but the economic deception would be considered to be adulteration. Color additives in the U.S. have to be approved by the FDA for use as color, so the use of an unapproved color additive would be an adulteration. And I'll show you some examples of some of these uh, further on. Fruit products may also be considered adulterated if they contain any non-nutritive object unless the object has functional value and is not hazardous to a consumer's health. Al alcohol can actually be an adulterant in a confectionery if the amount exceeds 0.5%. Uh, and the presence of the alcohol is not permitted under the state laws in which the confectionery is intended to be sold.
Now, misbranding, on the other hand, is defined in the Food Drug Cosmetic Act, and it's one of the more common issues that firms have with their food labels. A food's misbranded if the label fails to declare one of the following, uh, and these are the basic mandatory elements on a food package. Um, be the product name, the common or usual name of the food, the net quantity of contents, the ingredient statement with the allergens disclosed, the manufacturer's or distributor's name and place of business, or the nutrition information. However, there are some exemptions for including nutrition on some products. There are, uh, the FDA can take uh, various legal actions depending on the severity of the misbranding. A food would be considered to be misbranded if the label fails to declare the presence of artificial colors, flavors and chemical preservatives. Those are called out specifically in the Food Drug Cosmetic Act and need to be declared and identified. This information may be required in the name of the product or it could be in the ingredient statement. So failing to include a term like imitation on the label of the food uh, is considered to be a misbranding. A product could be misbranded if a beverage claims or implies that it contains juice and does not declare the percentage of fruit or vegetable juice on the label. Misbranding also applies to misleading information. A label may be considered misbranded if the information is false or misleading. Uh, also, if the container that the food is in is made or formed or filled in such a way to be misleading. So I refer to that as slack fill, not putting enough food in there. And uh, the consumer believes that they're getting more food in the package than is really there. Also, if the required label information is not conspicuous, this can be a misbranding. Uh, for an example, a bag of chips that's filled halfway with chips and then halfway with air, that could be considered misleading because the consumer believes that there's more food in the package. Another example of misbranding would be if the font color for late required label information is too close in color to the background on the label and the consumer cannot easily read it. Now this kind of summarizes now what adulteration and misbranding is, and those happen quite frequently. Uh, as I've said before, it's a lot of times it's not intentional. However, food fraud would be uh, doing one of these things uh, with a deliberate, you know, deliberately having a misbranding or a adulteration. So there's not a official regulatory definition. However, this is one that I think encompasses a lot of the aspects of food fraud. And that's a, it's a deliberate and intentional substitution, addition, tampering or misrepresentation of food, food ingredients or food packaging or false or misleading statements about a product for economic gain. And that's a critical uh, component. A lot of, we see this uh, graphic a lot of times and it provides some of the buckets that food fraud is placed into, but there's often an overlap. Uh, for instance, a bottle of, that's labeled as olive oil that actually contains another type of oil would actually be a substitution. However, of course, you're, uh, you would also have a misbranding because you have it labeled as olive oil. I went looking for some of the most fraudulent foods and found a couple of references. Uh, the first one refers to some categories of foods, while the second one mentions some specific varieties. I kind of looked through it and I, I wasn't really that familiar with coffee fraud and um, I got to thinking about it and I did a little research and of course coffee's brown so you could actually dilute coffee out with you know quite a number of different substances that were ground up. Uh, and that's typically what they would find uh, when you have coffee food fraud. And produce also seemed a little odd. I just thought, how can you fake an apple? <laughs> but generally the food fraud was referring to a uh, misrepresentation, for instance, of labeling, such as the organic status, uh, geographical origin, so claiming that the uh, produce came from a certain region when it didn't, and then, or possibly a varietal, 
misbranding or mislabeling of the product. Some uh, specific instances fitting into those categories, we have a substitution, uh, a horse meat. Uh, many of us have heard about uh, the use of horse meat in place of other types of meat. Uh, fish and seafood is very, uh, is a big problem in the U.S. We have a lot of mislabeling and misbranding, and I have uh, an example of that coming up. Uh, dilution, of course, honey, that's always been a big issue, uh, especially in the United States. The honey's often been diluted with the sugar syrup. Uh, as I mentioned with olive oil, that is subject to a lot of food fraud. Uh, for spices, um, let's see. Yeah, spices, uh, there was a, in 2014, a lot of issues with cumin. Uh, they found that it was diluted with ground peanuts and almond shells. In addition to this being an adulteration of the product, it posed a food safety issue due to the allergens that were introduced by putting that in that spice and just calling it cumin. Um, higher quality juices being diluted with, um, you know, not as economically desirable juices, uh, very commonly done. Um, mislabeling. So now in the U.S. we have to label our seafood as whether it's wild or f farm raised. And a lot of mislabeling goes on in that area. Uh, organic certifications, that will tell you whether or not you can call your food organic, but we do get companies putting organic on them when they're actually not. Um, some animal raising claims, things like uh, free range, uh, those are commonly placed on packages, but we have some things to kind of uh, counterbalance that now. And then last, we have some false claims, just uh, misleading statements that companies put on the package. Uh, preservative free, uh, nothing artificial, those, all of those types of things, those can be considered to be food fraud. Now, as I mentioned, seafood in the U.S. has a big issue. <laughs> I think they're starting to take a closer look at it. Um, there's a lot of studies that have been done, uh, but 90% of the seafood consumed in the U.S. is imported, and less than 1% is inspected by the government for fraud. See, that kind of opens up the uh, opportunity to have a lot of mislabeling and adulteration in those products. The FDA did provide what we call the seafood list, and it provides the appropriate market names for the items, uh, you know, seafood and fish and shellfish and those types of things. But there's still numerous studies that are showing that seafood in the U.S. continues to be mislabeled. Now, back in 2013, there was an Oceana study, and 33% of the seafood was mislabeled, they found. Uh, some of the key findings, this one was just shocks me that only seven of 120 red snapper samples collected nationwide were actually red snapper. And then we have, uh, you know, some uh, uh, various types of fish being mislabeled. Um, and then we get it, start getting into some food safety issues. For example, there was 84% of white tuna samples were actually a species that could cause some serious digestive issues for some individuals who eat more than a few ounces. So that definitely could be a food safety issue for some consumers. Also, the uh, fish that can have higher mercury contents uh, were being substituted in for what was expected to be safer fish from that perspective. So this could affect some of those sensitive groups, uh, such as pregnant women. Uh, then we have, you know, the, just the various different ones being misbranded and then surprisingly even overfished or vulnerable species being substituted for more sustainable catch. So uh, a lot of issues in those areas, we have to keep a close eye on how the seafood industry is doing with their labeling. Now, one that a lot of you may have heard about, if you've been around for a little while, some of you younger ones, maybe not. Uh, back in 2007, uh, there was <clears throat> melamine being placed into wheat gluten that was being, and also a, a rice protein concentrate 
that was being used in uh, pet foods. Uh, there were dogs and cats that started having some issues and uh, they traced it back to the melamine which is being placed into this gluten and the rice concentrate. Melamine is rich in nitrogen so when we test for protein in food products that's what is picked up is nitrogen. So these products were testing out as being you know higher in protein than they actually were. Uh, the melamine can affect the kidneys and it creates kidney stones and cause death in humans and animals. Uh, so there was, um, you know, it was a serious issue back in 2007 and then following that in 2008 they had uh, melamine being found in milk and infant formula and that did kill six babies and uh, target or uh, affected around 300,000 people. Now something as simple as just a, a mislabeling statement can actually be economically profitable. Uh, here was a situation for where about a, a, you know, a year and a half a farm falsely packaged and sold more than 206,000 dozen eggs. Uh, they claim to be free range or barn laid. And so you can tell in this green box how much additional money was made just from that kind of statement. Now the USDA in the US actually has purview over uh, beef, pork and poultry foods uh, for consumers. So the labeling of those, that's where you often will see the animal raising claims. And it has prompted some changes by USDA for these animal raising claims. They now have guidance documents out about this. Uh, you can see from this purple box, this was an example from the guidance document that they have put out that uh, if you're going to claim something like humanely raised, uh, you'll need to explain what is meant by that. Um, that's pretty small type. I hopefully you can see it. It's TMB Ranch defines humanely raised as the animals being cage free and vegetarian fed. Um, cage free, if you want to make that type of statement, it should be defined on the label. And again, remember this is for products that are sold under USDA purview. Uh, so unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily affect the shell eggs, uh, so making those claims, but uh, wouldn't hurt to include that type of explanation. Uh, USDA has actually kind of backed off a little bit on some of these, however, Doing the label review, USDA does actually do a label review of all of the products under their purview and uh, companies need to provide the documentation to substantiate these types of claims. So I think they've got a pretty good handle on that so that we're having less in the way of misbranding or mislabeling in those areas. Country of origin can often be a source of mislabeling. Uh, now around the world we do have products that are can only be named with certain names if they are made in a certain region. And in the EU, uh, you're very familiar with that, we have a lot of things that are like cheeses where they're protected. It's a PDO, protected designation of origin. Um, however, those are not enforced in all countries. Uh, so something like that being sold at the US, uh, we're just you know trusting what's on the label as to be actually be from that region. Uh, so we have to be cautious with those types of foods in those areas. Uh, just simple geographical origin uh, statements, those need to be truthful and appropriately, but appropriately qualified if necessary. Uh, if you are selling oranges and they're all from Florida, you can label them as Florida oranges. Uh, same with Georgia peaches, those would be examples. Uh, but if we have a barbecue sauce and it's just following a certain style, it's not necessarily made in Texas, it would be more appropriate to qualify it as a Texas style barbecue sauce. Um, but we can often see deception in these country of origin statements. Now, 
Back when most of the food labeling regulations for the U.S. were being written, internet sales were pretty much non-existent. <laughs> so we're talking about it back in the early 90s. Uh, so over time, this lack of instruction or directions increased the chance for food fraud and foods sold online. Some of the companies that are selling online, you know, they're small and lesser known, uh, so they kind of can fly under the radar easy, more easily. Uh, they can cut out some expenses by selling directly to consumers. More than likely, there isn't a retailer providing oversight on the labeling of the foods that are sold on the internet. Uh, it kind of depends on, you know, if there's a, if it's an internet sales site or uh, if it's just somebody selling directly on the internet. Uh, so there's more potential for having the misbranded or adulterated food that can slip through. So what exactly is required for food sold in the U.S., specifically those that are sold through the Internet? Does labeling information have to be on the website? Now, as I said, you know, when the laws were written, this is back before we even had, you know, anything in the way of Internet sales. Um, so FDA has always said that mail order products should be treated the same way as uh, retail food products. So you would treat it the same as if you, uh, if the product was being put into the store. I assume that part of that was due to manufacturers being able to sell the product either in a store or they could turn around and sell it online. Uh, the five basic elements to go on food packages, which I mentioned before, uh, under the misbranding section are a product name, net contents, ingredients with the allergens, uh, responsible company information, and then oftentimes nutrition information. Some exemptions do uh, exist, uh, such as insignificant nutrients and things like that. Also, if you have other types of statements on the package, you may be required to have additional information. For instance, organic labeling, you would need to have the identity of the certification agent listed on the package. The information for internet sales has to be present on the package. So once it is shipped out to the consumer, you open it up, you should see you know, the typical labeling that you would expect for a U.S. product. So that kind of makes it interesting. There's really no mandate that that labeling information be presented online at the point of purchase. In addition, if you're going to use uh, another language, there's some special requirements. You do have to label in English for the U.S. market. If you're going to use a second language, all of the regulated elements need to be pres present uh, in both of the languages. So you'd list in English and also the second language. This product on this uh, slide I uh, pulled off from a internet sales uh, area and it was only shown as in um, shown with a, a language other than English. Now, I don't know once you order it how it would come. I'm expecting that it would probably be the same way. Uh, they did a, a little bit of a translation by identifying the product, but you really didn't have the ingredient information or nutrition information or anything like that in the English language. Here's another example that I found at that same sales site. Uh, the, now, the nice thing about the sales sites, what they're doing now is that you can, they actually have different views of the product. So you can actually view the information on the package on the internet before you actually purchase the item. So it kind of, you know, helps out the consumer from that perspective. Now, this package is just, uh, it's a soy sauce, and that was all I, I found out I could get the how many fluid ounces it was and also the identity of the product but that was it uh, there wasn't anything that was identifying it uh, the ingredients or anything like that so this could be a misbranding if when it's shipped and it comes to the consumer that the U.S. labeling is not there uh, so those you have to be careful about that type of sales Also in the U.S., we do have what we call standards of identity. As I mentioned with uh, the EU, we have uh, 
the protected designation of origin on cheeses and some other types of foods. Uh, with the U.S., we just have standards of identity that would describe the how a product with that standardized name uh, is made, that what ingredients are present, and then it also spells out what ingredients cannot be included in those types of foods. You still have to list all of the ingredients so you're not really hiding anything. <laughs> um, but uh, it does you know, tell you what can go into the food and what shouldn't be there. If you use the name of a standardized food, then you do have to comply with the standard of identity. Now, the standards of identity were developed to hopefully help prevent some of the adulteration or deception, but of course it can't prevent the purposeful economic deception. Now, in the U.S., there's quite a number of categories of standardized foods. Some examples are cheeses, uh, bread even. We have whole wheat bread, things like that. Some of the chocolate products, canned fruits and vegetables, mixed nuts, those all have uh, specific standards. I also want to mention the ingredients, uh, additives, and colors in the U.S. Uh, just like any other country, they're going to have specific regulations or requirements for their use. Um, all ingredients need to be listed on an ingredient label, so you should be disclosing everything that's in the product. There are a few exceptions, uh, incidental additives, things that are you know, insignificant to the food and present at low levels, uh, spice names, so you can collectively refer to spices as just spices, you don't have to identify the individual ones. Uh, some, there's some other categories that wouldn't have to be included by name, but otherwise everything else would. So, you know, it should be identified what is present in the food. Now, with food additives, uh, FDA has taken on the, well, in a lot of cases, FDA has taken on the burden of uh, finding the scientific evidence to review um, the additive to make sure that it would be safe to be used in food products. So those are approved uh, by a thorough review by FDA. Uh, over time, the process for this has kind of changed and the companies that want to use certain ingredients can notify FDA of their intent to use an ingredient in their food products and then provide the science behind the assessment of safety. FDA can then review these notifications and then accept it uh, by saying that they have no objection to the information. And then now we have actually companies can do what we call a self-affirmation of safety. So for some of the grass ingredients that you've heard about, uh, generally recognized as safe as grass, G-R-A-S, uh, companies can determine that they do have enough science to show that the ingredient would be safe in the food or that it has been used historically and with safety. So um, it's kind of a gray area. So sometimes it's hard to know whether ingredients that are being put into the foods um, actually are acceptable to be there. Now color additives need to be approved by FDA as color ingredients. They actually, we have what we call our uncertified colors, things like caramel color, um, uh, whoosh, an, a natto extract color. <laughs> I was losing it there quickly. And uh, those are non-certified colors, but they do have regulations for using those in foods. Uh, our, we have what we call our certified colors. So things like tartrazine and brilliant blue, those actually are batch certified by FDA. Uh, and you cannot use the uncertified version for U.S. foods. Um, so in my perusing on the internet, I found a very interesting type of product. Um, we have what they labeled as what we call wasabi. And uh, it's a very popular but very expensive ingredient. It's similar to horseradish. I know the purists out there are going to 
hurt, hurt me for that <laughs> statement, uh, but it is totally different you know, in most regards. Uh, but yeah, you know, most of the products out on the market often will have horseradish in there. So this product is wasabi and the ingredients shown are just mustard powder and horseradish and then has cornstarch as a carrier or probably a, a flow agent. Uh, so it's definitely a mislabeling from the aspect that they're labeling it as wasabi, but it, it doesn't actually have any wasabi in it. And here is the example of the color additives that FDA certifies that are in the product that uh, they sh probably have not been batch certified by FDA and it's probably an adulteration in the product. So this was setting out, you know, for sale on the internet. On the face of it, it, it looks like it's okay. It's an okay product. When you start digging down deeper into uh, the labeling of it, you find out that it's probably, you know, misbranded or uh, adulteration. Okay, and that was a very quick overview of uh, labeling in the U.S. Um, but I wanted to tie it into that and just kind of bring some of these issues up to make you more aware of the possibilities or, you know, what's actually being placed out on the market. Um, now, AIB International, we do have a food safety department. We can provide you with more detailed information about assessing vulnerabilities and mitigating risks for food fraud. Um, but to kind of round this off, I wanted to mention uh, a list of a few of the preventative measures tied into material specifications and labeling. Uh, so preventing food fraud, know uh, what your materials are and what the risks are. So if you purchase honey as an ingredient, be aware of the food fraud history for that ingredient that has often been diluted with um, uh, sugar syrups. Be sure to choose a reputable company from which to source your ingredients and be sure to do a thorough assessment of companies that you're less familiar with. Check uh, specifications of ingredients, any certifications. So if they're certifying it as gluten free, you know, ask to see the certifications and make sure it's up to date and that it is valid. And ask any questions about those ingredients. Know which tests you need to see for any of the verifications. So let's say for uh, olive oil, if there's a certain test that will verify that you have olive oil, be sure that that document is in your specifications. Uh, be sure to work with suppliers. Uh, they should have the, their own robust food safety measures that include food fraud control. And work with someone in labeling if you're working in an area that you're unfamiliar with, uh, such as, you know, working on the U.S. market. Uh, work with somebody that is familiar with the labeling requirements in that country in which the product's being sold. Um, AIB, we do provide labeling services. Uh, we can help you with U.S. and Canadian uh, markets. So that is one option if you do have issues or questions uh, trying to get the product into the market in the U.S. Um, we do, we actually work on, um, we work for a major retailer doing a review of their products. And one example, uh, we had them labeling, a company was labeling the product as organic and we asked for their organic certificate and they had a very hard time uh, showing us that. Uh, we finally got it and it was uh, had expired. Uh, so we <laughs> had to work, it was a long period of time and we finally got an up-to-date uh, organic certificate. So those are some examples of things that you should be doing about your ingredients and your materials. We also have uh, more resources for you in food fraud. Uh, coming up in October, October 22nd and 23rd, there's going to be an online virtual course and this will have more to do from the aspects of uh, food safety and uh, you can find it on our AIB website and sign up for that if you'd like. We also have a food fraud online so if you want to do a class at your own pace uh, you can find that on our website. Uh, we do have food labeling classes for the U.S. market. Uh, there are 
two days long, so I, could, <laughs> I had a hard time covering too much in just an hour's time. Uh, but we are scheduling those for next year, so uh, check out our website and you can find those uh, available. Uh, any questions you ever have, you feel free to contact AIB International and you can find us at AIBinternational.com or you can find us uh, on LinkedIn. I think that's all I have, Simon, for today. Great. Yeah, super. Okay. Thanks very much, Elaine. Sure. Yeah, if you switch your webcam back on, okay. we'll... Uh, I'll also put a link to, uh, well, the contact details uh, in the follow-up email that we send as well. Okay. So if anybody wants to check out and link to the AIB website as well. So I, I, we have got quite a few questions. Yeah. As usual, I just thought they're very product-specific, a lot of them. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, like I said, the labeling. I mean, everybody, you say yeah. labeling and people get on and uh, it's just so hard to cover very much in just an hour or so. Yeah. So we'll see if you, if you, you know, if we, if yeah. you can answer it. Do you know anything about beer? <laughs> A little bit. That's yeah. in the U.S. It's actually covered under uh, TTB. It's uh, trade tobacco taxes, trade taxes. I can't remember what it stands okay. for. They change it all the time. But um, well, they have oversight on alcoholic beverages. But okay, well, Michael. Yeah, mm -hmm. Michael's asking, do you have any examples of food fraud in the beverages brewing industry, beer. particularly brewing of beer? Any Anything that you can think of? No, I don't. I didn't look anything up on that. Uh, okay, so no I don't worries. have any on the beer. No problem. And that is, is there a certain type of fish which has a higher mercury content? That's yeah. yeah, there's a, the fatty fish usually because it will settle down in the fat area um but the salmon I was they say do. Salmon. yeah salmon's very good for you and in fact i kind of follow this myself i'm like okay i need to have some salmon you know get those omega-3s that type of That's thing it. but uh you probably should limit it i do maybe about every other week instead of every week i try and use other fish you know on the other off what, because of mercury, potentially? Yes, because of mercury. Ah, mm -hmm. right, okay. Yeah. Um, al badil Haram, uh, is there any adulteration on date paste production? I don't know of any specific. I'd have to look. Um, okay. I can't think of it. And, you know, anything really has the potential. Date paste is a brown paste, and you think about mm. all the things that you could probably... Uh, adultery yeah. with so it's always possible mm. but i don't know of anything specific yeah but like you say a paste it would be quite relatively easy mm -hmm. i imagine i imagine uh, uh, nazish how to ensure the olive oil received from the supplier is pure and not adulterated there's been a number of things that have come out to help with that. Uh, there's some specific tests for that, and I'm not familiar with them myself, uh, but I can easily find some information online. Um, so if anybody would like to, you know, send us emails in the future, you you know, feel free to contact us and uh, we'll follow up on those questions. So. Yeah, because they are very specific. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Nadish, um, for fish, is there any adulterant used to help weigh more or, or t change the taste? <laughs> yeah, I would say probably water and ice, that type of thing. You have to, there's specific requirements surrounding ice. They often put ice on there and freeze it, uh, or I'm sorry, water, and it turns into ice. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's <laughs> a lot of adulteration in those areas. Okay, yeah, and Prem, uh, what's Premsman. There are different species of red snappers available depending on the species name. Always better to provide Latin name. This will avoid economical fraud. Okay. Yeah. So yeah and the seafood list out there uh, that FDA provides, they do have, you look at the species of fish and it will tell you what the market name is for it. So, yeah. Okay. And Noreen, is there any lab? Can labs identify the geographical origin of fruits and vegetables by continent? Wow. That one I don't know. If anybody knows, yeah, <laughs> that would be in on that. Uh, I imagine, you know, it's kind of like CSI detective where they can. Uh, soil or something mm -hmm. like that. Or, mm. Yeah. 
A DNA profile of a fruit or yes. vegetable, yeah. Yeah. Laurie, what legal obligation does an, does Amazon have to prevent distributing fraudulent goods? Well, that's a good question. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, their site, it appears that you know they often give their responsibility over to the people who list on there. So they're just kind of like a host. Um, mm. But that I, I don't know. They do have their own grocery area. I'm going to guess that they do do some oversight on any of those items. But the third party sellers, I think they probably are going to leave that up to them. Mm. Now, and I don't know if FDA has weighed in, in on that. Um, so that would be interesting to find out. It is huge, Amazon. Huge. Yes, it is. Uh, Lak Shaman, how to identify food, food fraud of crab meat? I don't know on that one. Yeah. I would say w when we send the follow up email, we'll put the contact details of AIB and, and then they'll be more than happy to answer your specific questions, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Faruzi, uh, is it necessary to assess the risk of fraud for each raw material separately from its suppliers? Not necessarily. I mean, it's like that kind of that last slide I put on there uh, that kind of summarizes. Um, there's more on assessing your vulnerabilities and looking into that type of information, the risk assessment and the mitigation. Um, so I'd, if you are not familiar with that, I would definitely recommend, you know, taking a class in that. Um, it would help you. It helps you. It's more of a general you know, look at the supplier, the reliability of the supplier, um, you know, trusting what they're providing. Um, so is it, it, you know, something like salt, if they, you know, got salt and, you know, yeah, in most cases you're not going to have to worry about that if you're using a reputable supplier. Uh, but there are some ingredients, like I said, those, the ones that have the history. Honey, mm -hmm. I think I'd always be checking the honey. Uh, yeah. So that would be one or olive oil. Yeah. If it, you know, really checking those. So I think we're as a manufacturers, we're hyper aware of a lot of those type of items. So they're starting sure. to be checked. Sure. Um, Nandish again, how, co how can a common individual identify whether fruits contain high, low, what, what levels of pesticide residue? Um, uh, that's a tough one um, mm. yeah it uh, as a common individual I assume you meaning that you purchase the item in the grocery store or something like that mm. um, that um, I don't have an answer for that and I think it's it gets into depending or relying on your retailer or your uh, company that has provided the product uh, mm. using a reputable brand name type thing but yeah and always yeah. make sure you thoroughly wash your fruits and vegetables yes yeah more uh, than likely there's something there so yeah Abdul, unwanted heavy metals or pesticide contamination in foods is it adulteration or food fraud both. Uh, both i mean it could be both yeah uh, yeah it's an adulteration if it is present. Uh, if you knew about it and left it, didn't do anything about it, then it's food fraud. So it's an intentional deception. Okay, Prem, US FDA has stringent food adulteration acts. And why still not printing in the incoming foods? Uh, don't quite make sense. Can you, does that, can you decide for that? Preventing? Is it supposed to be preventing? Ah, uh, could be, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is, isn't it? In the incoming foods. Hmm. I'd like to know more about that. It sounds like somebody had something specific in mind. Uh, hmm. Okay, let's skip that one. Teresa, yeah. can you give an example or examples of incidental <laughs> additives? Yeah, those always get tricky. Uh, you know, water, I mentioned earlier, is an adulterant, uh, but it can actually be an incidental additive. Uh, for instance, uh, we make saltines, and you can't really run a floury mixture through the press and cut out crackers. So you've got to add water to the mixture to get mm -hmm. it to actually sheet through the rollers and get them cut and print and baked. 
Uh, so once it's baked, all of that added water actually gets dissipated. Uh, so at that point, you don't have to list the water. It's considered to be an incidental additive. And that's one that people don't often think about. Um, water is very versatile. <laughs> uh, but there can be uh, another example. Let's say you buy a seasoning blend. Uh, it's got a bunch of spices and things in it. Often they'll put an anti-caking agent in there, a silicon dioxide, to help with the flow and also to keep it from caking when it's sitting on your shelf. Once you add that to maybe a wet system, so a dough where it gets wetted, uh, that silicon dioxide no longer is functioning in that regard. It's a very inert ingredient. Uh, that would be a good example of an incidental additive once it goes into your um, dough system, let's say. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, in um, how how can we detect mincemeat adulteration? Um, Wow. Now, naming of mincemeat has changed over the years. Uh, the original version of it actually did have meat, and it has become more acceptable to be naming. It's mainly like fruits, you know, the dried fruit type thing. Um, it has become more acceptable, acceptable in the U.S. to refer to that as mincemeat. Um, so I don't know that it is so much of a misleading or an adulteration. I'd have to see, you know, not a whole lot of manufacturers of mince meat, but it'd be interesting to see how they are actually labeling that if they're providing any additional information on the front of the package. Okay, Marve, in in an excess of grass, G R A S ingredient mm -hmm. considered adulteration. Can you it tell me what gra what's grass? Grass, yeah, that's generally recognized as safe. So this is a a, a grouping or what we call it, a level of uh, food additives. And um, grass, it used to be, you know, FDA had to review them all and accept them. Uh, over the years, they've opened it up for manufacturers to get the science and say, yeah, we're going to go ahead and use this in these foods at these levels. Yeah. Uh, and this is our science. And then FDA can accept it. But then they can also do that self-affirmation. Um, so if uh, excess, uh, so if it is defined in a regulation or in their notice, the manufacturer's notice, the amount, you know, there's certain levels that they define in that and you go in excess, it could be an adulteration. But if you as a company has self-affirmed it as grass to use higher levels, then it would not necessarily be that. Um, so it gets a little tricky because we just, I don't like it. You can kind of tell by disdain <laughs> in the U.S. It's like you like to have FDA saying, yes, you can use this or no, you can't. And uh, there's so much out there that companies have decided is okay to use. So, mm -hmm. but, Okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, Vicky, does U.S. importer require to show certificates when products is labeled organic or pesticide free? Possibly the importer. Um, most of the retailers now, they're, you know, if they're going to sell the product in their store, they are doing a review of the product. Uh, if it's, you know, especially if it's being imported in, they'll want to have the information. So it's definitely the paper trails now. Um, we've come so far in the food industry that you really need to have those certifications on hand. If FDA comes in and asks for them, they're going to ask you for those type of certifications. So it's good okay. to just keep the paper trail going. There's a lot of paperwork that has to go with food products now. Sure. Uh, Laurie, is there a complete list of grass? Also, there was a change in the approved colors and also levels of color specified. Can you also comment on why FDA and CFIA levels are different? Oh, approved colors and levels of color. I don't know why they're different. Um, I mean, you know, each country we have different regulations and different requirements. That's what makes it so hard to use one label in multiple countries because it usually is not compliant. Uh, but I don't really know the basis behind each of them. Uh, 
complete list of grass. There is a section in the uh, Code of Federal Regulations in the U.S. that lists most or a lot of the grass items. There's also um, a new list, they call it a grass notice inventory that's established on the FDA website. And those are the ones that uh, people in the industry have put in notifications to FDA for FDA to review them. Now, the ones that where they're self-affirming as grass, we don't have a comprehensive list of those. Uh, so you can get most of them out there. You know, we usually encourage companies, you know, if you're going to use a new ingredient to go ahead and submit it to FDA to get that acceptance because it will, more companies can use it that way and uh, people feel more confidence and it will put it that way. Okay. Aline, how does USDA uh, manage fraud in food contact packaging? I don't think they do, do they? Or do they? I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> is, is food packaging under USDA's remit or not? I don't know. And food contact packaging. I'm no. not sure. No. If you're talking about the actual packaging that coming in contact with the food, I know FDA, they have, you know, established um, regulations for substances for that. Um, I would assume that USDA follows those guidelines too, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't think I've ever delved quite that far into them. Okay. Um, Stephanie, um, what about the expiration date? What if a factory uses an expired raw material and thereafter labels the final product with an expiration date that is after three months? or if the raw material will expire in the next month, but the expiration date of the final product is three months. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to depend on what ingredient we're talking about. You know, it's kind of like retail foods. They say that the expiration dates, they mean different things. So it, uh, uh, is it quality or is it safety? So if it's just kind of a quality and you use something after uh, its expiration date, you know, more than likely it's not going to be a problem. But if it is a food safety issue, then you're, yes, you're probably purposely adulterating the food. Uh, so that would be a food fraud situation. Okay, uh, let's move on. Clement, uh, another question about packaging um, guidelines. Food fraud, uh, looking for examples of guidelines, uh, mainly linked with packaging. Uh, just, I think I remember mm -hmm. on previous webinar we're talking about fraud in packaging. It's not a big, it, because they usually technical products, you know, food packaging, they, they're not, uh, fraud isn't some uh, top of fraudsters list to, mm -hmm. you know, like say, um, make a fraudulent packaging film. It's just not worth the time and effort. Right. Um, uh, as, as opposed to something like honey or like you said, or olive oil um, is much easier fruit. So I don't think there's packaging, these guidelines on food fraud in packaging at all. Okay. Do you, uh, unless you do. No, not that I know of. No. Uh, Benjamin, um, we are an organic and conventional grain cleaner and milling company. I don't find much fraud other, other than organic fraud in the grain industry. What do you know of relating to cereal grains? I've not heard of much specific. I mean, it's, it's something else that you could actually, you know, grind up other substances and have it in flour uh, that mm. historically we used to have things like that, but it, it doesn't occur as much as it used to. Yeah. Uh, so in that area, but yeah, I, I agree. The organic that's, <laughs> I'll get people calling me and saying, I'm using organic sugar. I'm going to call my product organic. And I was like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you got specific, specific requirements, but yeah, grain, it's, I don't think it's, um, what lucrative to no. adulterate grains as much. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, next one, Niha, Niha, Niha. Uh, if a supplier is packaging dried herbs to be sprinkled on pizza toppings, do they or do they not have to declare all the herbs 
What if the vendor is adding banned leaves, such as marijuana, in it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, CBD and marijuana. That's a whole new story in the U.S. Um, yeah. The herbs, yes, they all often can be called just spices. So there's just a few that are used for color, things like uh, saffron and turmeric and paprika. They're used for color. Uh, they can't be represented as just spices, but most of the others can be, so you wouldn't have to actually call out the specific ones. It's a nice little caveat by FDA for those types of products. Okay. Um, let's have a look. Uh, Ma, Ma Suzette, uh, do we need to put the nutrition value in the packaging if our product is refined sugar? Oh, yeah. Uh, if you're selling refined sugar, you would have a nutrition facts panel on there. There are, under the new regulations for the U.S., uh, we have the added sugars values. There are some uh, special allowances for products being sold as sugars, so that would apply to corn syrups and honeys and things like that. Um, I, you know, I'd probably have you contact me, and I can send you an example of uh, what they are allowing, where you don't have to put the actual amount of added sugars, but you still have to have the percent daily value. I guess it's kind of detailed and complex for this. So, but uh, yep, so you do need to have a nutrition panel. Okay, Michaela, when you state check for when you said check for specifications and certifications, is that referring to certificate of analysis? Sure. I'm new. To, I'm new to this, and I'm learning a lot in a short amount of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. If um, yeah, that tells you what you need to know, and there you know various documentation. So, uh, as we talked about with organic, make sure you get an organic certification if that's what they have. You want to make sure it's reputable. Um, there's a gluten, you know, gluten free. If you're in that area, that would be an example of uh, a lot of companies do a certification. They don't do a certification. You might want to get some lab analysis showing that they're under the 20 parts per million for the U.S. market. Um, so there's various things that you can ask for that they really should have done to verify different types of statements on the package. Um, so that that would be what we'd recommend. Are you familiar with uh, blockchain technology at all? Uh, yeah, lightly. Um. <laughs> well, the question from Maria then is, uh, <laughs> is blockchain, te blockchain technology recognized as a tool uh, to control food fraud? Um, that I don't know. Yeah. Yep. We'll have to turn that over to our food safety guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Should have uh, Earl on here too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Michael, I had to step out for a minute, so sorry if this has been already covered. Can you speak to requirements for listing ingredients in ingredient statement versus listing as natural or artificial flavor? Huh. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, natural flavor, well, natural and artificial flavor are both defined in the regulation. So if it doesn't meet that, then you do have to call it out by name. And there's some ingredients that are, are not quite so obvious, uh, and one of those being the hydrolyzed proteins, things like yeast extract, autolyzed yeast extract, and hydrolyzed soy protein. Those types of ingredients have to be called out by name. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not too sure if that goes further than that, but feel free to email me if you need further clarification. Okay, Nazish, uh, is may, may contain some trace allergens enough to say for foods that are packaged in a facility where other allergens may be present, but the product itself doesn't? Okay, maybe person. Yeah. Stuff. Okay. Yeah, we're getting into allergens and the process in a facility type statements. Those are voluntary statements for the food industry. Um, it's a matter of whether you feel it's necessary to include that on there. Um, so it's a risk assessment. I generally recommend on those, if you're going to put them on, is definitely consult your lawyer, your food lawyer, and uh, see what their recommendations are on those. 
Uh, Mohammed, uh, does AIB have any product certification scheme? If yes, can we name it as it is based on ISO 17065? I don't know <laughs> yeah, those are certified audits. Um, I don't, I, I'm not going to know if we have that one specifically. I think we do. But, yeah, uh, best to reach out to AIB. Um, yeah. yeah, you check out our website. We do have a certification area there and it will tell you which audits we have. And, you know, if you don't get your question answered, we do have um, a chat on our website and that is manned. So if you want to talk with somebody, you feel free to do that. Great. Um, Marugan, food fraud in chili powder? I'm sure. <laughs> Seems like uh, uh, one that would uh, be Yeah, I think, do. I don't know of any specific instances. I think we could probably do a search online and pull up a lot of those, but um, it's, you know, a dark color and, uh, you know, if there's anything in there that's expensive, I'm sure that it has in history uh, been yeah. substituted. I mean, there's the specifications, certificate of analysis, all, all the things you get from your supplier. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's testing a, a lab, mm -hmm. you know, as well. I guess, because a, a few, I've skipped over a few questions, but asking about how to test for adulteration of this, for that, mm -hmm. it, it would be to send to a lab. It, yeah, basically. yeah. Check with them to see if they can test for that. And uh, yeah, yeah. Have you ever come across adulteration or misbranding in energy drinks? Do you drink a lot of energy drinks, uh, Elaine? <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> That's an interesting one. I'm trying to think what would be substituted in. Mm. So they have a lot of interesting ingredients to begin with. I don't recall uh, it. No. Uh, I, it's just a lot of questions about what about in tomato yeah. paste and tomato mm. mix. Uh, um, yeah, that that is an interesting one. I mean, uh, El Tahir, is there a database, you know, like a, a, a database online for listing historical food fraud cases, you know, like a central point? Probably. Uh, one of them I referenced in one of the slides, it was Discernus. And they do actually have a food fraud database. Um, I'm not a member or, or uh, I don't subscribe to it. So I wasn't able to go in and look at that. Uh, but I did notice that they have that available. Um, but, you know, our food safety people, Earl Arnold, he would be one of them that I would contact, you know, in yeah. that direction. So to see if um, uh, he can provide some more sources. Okay. Uh, June, question from June. I have a customer that has asked that we do not list ingredient on his packaging because of proprietary formula. What <laughs> is the labeling requirement for food service items, restaurant use only for the okay. ingredient list? It's tough. Uh, the requirements are there that the ingredient list should be present on the package. So ultimately, if FDA wanted to, they could pick up your product and say it's misbranded if you didn't have it on there. Uh, we've seen this request before by different companies. Um, you know, all I can tell you is that it, it is required um, by regulation. It's food service. You know, the FDA does not um, look at food service packaging too often. We'll put it that way. <laughs> uh, yeah. But it should be present. So. Okay. Uh... Is it, I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment. When it comes to food fraud, history always examples relates to old incidents. Does it mean we don't have any major fraud histories in recent times? If so, what is the extent of reduction in fraud when compared to early days? Interesting. That's a good question. Looking at the history of it, make a good article, <laughs> Simon. <laughs> it would actually, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely see how, you know, what we're doing, if it's been effective. So, um, the, a lot of the seafood that, that I, yeah, I referred yeah. to, I showed you the study from 2013, but actually there, there's some more recent stuff, even from 2018 and 19, uh, showing that there is still a lot of misbranding going on out there. Yeah. There's substitutions and, um, so yeah, it is still going on out there. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Well, we, we're, I'm still nowhere near the top. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've seen some comments. Thank you very much and, and uh, great webinar, etc. cetera. Good, um, good. Let, let me just pick this one up from Julius. Um, what are your thoughts on Illinois recognizing sesame seed as an allergen <laughs> and not the rest of the U.S.? Do you think many companies are even labeling sesame seed? as an allergen? That is a very, very good question because just right before this I came on, uh, we're in the United States on Central Time, so I started my day and that was one of the first things I ran across was um, FDA has sent to the OMB uh, for review a guidance document about labeling sesame as an allergen in the United States. So look forward to major changes coming in that regard. I don't know what the guidance document says. We'll have to wait till that comes out to uh, get the details on that. Mm, Barbara, so, sorry, uh, go oh, on Elaine. Yeah, I was going to oh. mention Illinois. Um, yeah. It is difficult when Illinois, you know, or when the states does their own thing. We all know that from Prop 65 in California, which is food safety related. Now, what Illinois did was they said that any ingredient that it comes from sesame, you do have to identify in the ingredient name that there's sesame. They did not have the ability to add sesame in as an allergen. Uh, you know, when you have the contained statement, it says contains milk and soy, you can't put sesame in there. So really what Illinois was just doing was they were just saying that ingredients need to be identified as sesame that come from that. Um, so it really wasn't too much of a problem because I think most ingredients were already identified, but we were getting people listing things like tahini that comes from, is a sesame paste. They wouldn't list that. And then we had some natural flavors coming from sesame that were not being identified. Um, so hopefully companies were able to, you know, kind of tweak what they were labeling and get those included. Um, I don't agree with states doing it on their own. Um, mm -hmm. But they did, so. <laughs> but it, yeah. it's coming, so everybody yeah. watch for it. Somebody just mentioned as well in the UK recently there was a death related to sesame um, on on a, a type of bread. Yeah, so, um, that was in the retail. I think it was one of those subway shops or something in the yes uh, airport, maybe or something like Possibly, that. Possibly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, um, Oh, here's one from Teresa. Please go away, notification. <laughs> uh, right. For website sales, if you list the nutrition facts on the website but not on the product, is that okay? Currently, no, not according to FDA. Uh, it should be actually on the package if it's something that's required for that product. Yeah. Um, okay. Lots of, uh, right, I've, I've got to the top. I, I did skip okay. a few that were very product specific because it's the same answer all the time, really. Um, yeah. You know, it's very detailed, but you have experts at AIB and, and mm -hmm. you're very, very helpful. So I'll put, obviously, the contact details, the website, et cetera, and anybody can reach out to AIB at any time. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, enjoyed that, uh, Elaine. Did you? Good, good. Yeah. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Right. You can you can uh, go and have a cup of coffee now. Thanks very much for your yeah. time today, Elaine. I appreciate uh, it. Definitely. And oh. every, everyone have a good weekend. I think some people are probably almost into their weekend. <laughs> yeah. Hope to see you uh, when we put the schedule together for next year. Your name's going to be on the list. Fantastic. Okay. Love to do it. Thanks, Elaine. Have a nice weekend. All right. You guys too. Take care. Bye bye. Um, right, that was Elaine Malone from AIB International. Uh, sorry if we didn't get to your question. Uh, I am going to load in the sidebar one more time. So Food Safety Live next Wednesday, October the 15th. Uh, we're on for, I think, about 10 hours throughout the day. Um, so register, click the register. It's free. You will have access to, we'll have back-to-back -back presenters, 14 different presenters throughout the day, lots of different topics. Uh, we'll have presentation slides, Q&A, and then we'll move to the next one. 14, uh, if you register, you'll get access to the live event, 
the recording, all the slides, decks, and 14 certificates of attendance to collect. Ooh, what can you say for free? So click on the free registration button and register. <laughs> okay, so you do that now, uh, and then uh, five, four, three, two, one. I'm now going to load your certificate. So there you go, uh, your certificate for today. Add your own name, either print and sign it or open it in an image editing software and type your name. So thanks for your time today. Thanks for attending and, um, yeah, joining us. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I'll put a, a link to Food Safety Live and the program so that you can see what topics we're covering in the follow-up webinar email for this good point okay michael sheila leah key ashi julius thessalonica all of you we love you all thanks very much i'll see you on wednesday hopefully join us have a great weekend bye